Good evening, good evening. Good evening, good evening. So now we are having after the Al Weizmann show some three and a half months ago, we decided, Mama, we can have two floor lectures. If the one space here is, uh, is full, so for the ones who would feel at some point that the uh, luft is uh, luft, yeah, that the air is. Uh, uh, too bad for them in this room. They also then actually could go then in the other room where we have a, let's say, a kind of live transmission of the of the lecture. Uh, yeah, it's so my pleasure. I'm extremely happy that we have Mr. Herr Dietrich Dietrichsen uh, again back in Mama. It was about 2003 that they organized the lecture by Dietrich, who came here and lectured about John Meek. And actually, that uh, we have Dietrich this year in the year. Uh, March it must have been that Über Pop Music, this large, almost 500 pages volume has appeared in German so far. Uh, English uh, edition will be forthcoming in several years, so it's <laughs> good guess that, that it's a large volume. So, some, some translations already underway, uh, shortened versions, almost just in, uh, as you told me, just in uh, Dutch. They will now do very fast, but they also then this is the same, almost same family of languages. So extremely happy to have uh, Diedrich back here and uh, Mama. It's not just that he's published this year, uh, this volume last year in 2013, again also as a curator or co-curator, he has done a show in Berlin at House Kultur und der Welt on uh, the whole art catalog and the California and the disappearance of the outside. I would say a major also again. Uh, curatorial and artistic statement about <coughs> uh, the so-called Californian ideology and post. And uh, many writings of, of his uh, still, let's say, um, for, for a longer time, unavailable in, in other languages than German. Some of his uh, essays has been have been translated in the recent times, I would say, mostly efflux. But not, uh, and then also in, in many of the uh, catalogs. Also, I would mention also one thing which is uh, quite important for us as uh, being fans of James Benning uh, that uh, Diedrich also contributed an uh, essay in a, in a volume on James Benning, also Tanya, our friend Tanya Vogel has contributed the uh, her essay. So many, many things coming together. And, and actually, this was also a point where we have uh, come together uh, as the organizer here from MAMA, BUXA, Kulturpunkt, uh, and BHW. We have also, at some point, um, thought maybe to invite uh, or to suggest to Diedrich to speak about uh, our dear deceased friend Harun Faroki, who just had this is uh, uh, some uh, some two months ago. But again, I would say as uh, maybe we do it another time. Um, and so we actually use this time. And as uh, as uh, Diedrich has told me, this probably will be the first time that he he, he will do this kind of lecture on uh, or über pop music in English. So please let us welcome uh, Mr. Diedrichsen. And. Uh, Yeah. Um, yeah, let me just to say uh, we have planned so that the lecture is somehow between 45 and 60 minutes, and then afterwards we will have a Q and A session. Thank you very much. So please. Thank you very much. Can can you hear me? Is this, is this uh, device working? Yeah. Uh, it's, so it's, it's not. For the and for the okay. Other people okay. There. Okay. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not so so huge here. So thank you very much, Peter, for introducing and having me here. Uh, indeed, it is the first time I um, try to uh, bring these, I don't know exactly how many pages, but 468 um, uh, large pages uh, to uh, a, a yeah, 45 to 60 minute conclusion in English. I haven't done this before. I've done some, some talks about book in, in German or I have done dialogues but I have not uh, presented like this uh, and there will be a, a, an English version of the of the preface of the first I don't know 50 60 pages uh, um, coming up in this review called Grey Room um, yeah and, and it's also interesting to think of my last date here in Mama uh, in 2003 or 2004, I don't know, in, in, uh, the talk I gave then is actually one of the few things that survived from that 
period uh, and it uh, parts of it are actually landed in that book here so it's it was, uh, it was something that something grew out of now um, it's difficult to present this book because it's not um, um, arguing for a revision or a new perspective or something like that uh, it's more trying to define a field uh, uh, to even something like a subject matter uh, and connecting the, this subject matter with the word pop music um, and it's very important for me that in German I spell it with a hyphen although the normal German uh, uh, orthography would say to spell it without a hyphen uh, it, because of the kind of um, combined nature of, uh, of the subject matter and what I did in order to come up with this was basically doing a lot of distinctions uh, and I do not want to sound like uh, a system theorist although I maybe owe something to system theory or to Spencer Brown and to, to Luhmann when I'm saying that, that uh, I start with distinctions uh, but um, basically I am uh, decided to do that because um, the field of music and uh, the study of culture is still so much shaped by these implicit distinctions that um, even though they have been people have uh, spoke out against them millions of times, they still structure uh, the institutional side of the field, uh, the distinctions between high and low, the distinctions between, uh, between, certain, um, between written and improvised, and, and all these distinctions that, um, that uh, are basically been inherited uh, by, by musical practice, because people who, who practice music uh, are um, socialized and uh, uh, through schools and, and procedures that are based on these distinctions and I try to um, counter this uh, by yeah basically questioning most of these distinctions uh, but this book is not so much written against uh, an orthodoxy it tries something that I assume is somehow new so the first thing I, I start with is to distinguish uh, pop music and music. Uh, I'm, I'm arguing that uh, there is a difference between pop music and music. This has often been, this has been referred to as uh, that I'm saying that pop music is no music. I'm not necessarily saying that. Maybe music and pop music both belong to a bigger category. Uh, which is, might again be called music or something like that but uh, important to me is that there is this distinction and I'm trying to um, I'm trying to illustrate this um, first I'm, I was distinguishing pop music and popular music um, this is what, what could be done like historically uh, one could say uh, uh, popular music is the kind of uh, music that was based on oral traditions, on mnemotechnics of learning something by heart, uh, based on um, uh, the use of, of instruments in a certain way, and that could be become could could involve could develop traditions uh, without other devices like recording or scores or something like that and uh, on, on the other hand pop music would be uh, a product of the 20th century based on all kinds of um, economic and institutional um, yeah, uh, fundaments um, but I would put on the side of popular music also classical music classical European music um, and uh, most of the most uh, folkloristic or folk musics um, of the world although not being able to really decide about all of them but um, uh, the, the distinction goes along uh, several um, 
parameters. The first one would be um, all the non-pop music is basically ba is, is music oriented. It's um, um, uh, what what determines its its uh, its objecthood as a musical object are musical categories like uh, something that you could transpose into into notes or into other um, into other sign systems um, that define music. Whereas the pop music pop music is based on a, a multimedia construction. It is always not only music. You don't understand. Uh, a tone, a note, without having a question about uh, is this coming from a long-haired or a bald person? Is this coming from a person wearing sneakers or from a person wearing sandals? Uh, and this is a question that you not necessarily have uh, with music music. Um, the second thing is the, the mnemonic uh, unit, especially in, uh, not, not in all music music, but in most of them, uh, is is the melody? That's what you. That's that's this kind of. Um, um, that's what you remember. That's that's how you. Rem that's how you're reminded of it. That's how it becomes a psychological and um, mnemotechnical uh, entity. That's what the uh, psychoanalytic Theodor Reich calls the the haunting melody. This this is this is achieved by the melody itself. Uh, whereas the Whereas uh, the mnemonic entity, the thing that you remember in, uh, in pop music is a recording. Um, it's, if you remember a piece of pop music, the most important uh, component that identifies a certain relevant unit of pop music is um, a contingent or unintended uh, component of the recording. Some, some some coughing or some uh, even smaller, smaller sound-related um, um, little accidents around the recording that uh, define the uniqueness of the of the recorded voice, of the recorded instrument, of the recorded situation. Even if it's if it's uh, if it's a, a, a highly uh, industrialized. Um, perfect recording, then it's often a certain industry standard of a period, a certain synthesizer model that is no longer in use afterwards, that is uh, not a component of the aesthetic design of that recording, but of the recording itself, of the fact that it is recorded, that it, is been, that it has been made in a studio and uh, so develops a certain uh, identity. Uh, as opposed to a melody, which is basically you can transport, which you can transfer from from one recording to another, it stays the same. It's still identifiable as an as an object. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, then the th the third. Well, is it the third? Yeah. The next the next distinction is is the one between. Uh, a musical object and a media object. Here you can, on the level of musical object, you can you don't have to reduce it to this, to the melody, which I now used in a kind of uh, um, not hundred percent safe way uh, as a as a way to describe music, music um, as opposed to pop music. But you can you can use all kind of musical objects like also scores or um, 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 dance patterns or things like that whereas the basic unit in pop music is always a media object that means it is a it is a material object even if it's just a file uh, a file a cd a vinyl recording uh, all these these objects are have a have a material, so to speak, identity uh, outside of the fact uh, or beyond the fact that they that they are recording music or that they are storing music, um, and that leads to the next one, which is uh, uh, that the that the that the nature of music, uh, which has often been argued. Uh, Especially uh, among enthusiasts of improvisation, um, of uh, of the the non-commercial, anti-commercial aspect of music, that that music, music is a, is of an immaterial nature, and this was a big issue in 
and new music debates of the 50s and 60s, uh, whereas pop music, of course, is of a material nature. Um, it is based on, on actually, in its, what I call its heroic years, in its most important years, it's based on a black vinyl object which looks exactly like a minimalist sculpture, uh, like an industrial object, and it is stored in some kind of uh, colorful printed cardboard thing, which just looks like a work of pop art. And finally, the final distinction, uh, between, well not the final, but, but another one, we, we will probably not be able to talk about all of them, but another important distinction is the one between singularity and the repu reproduced nature uh, of, the, of the pop music object. It is reproducible. Uh, and uh, it is even, it, one can even say, uh, although uh, the recording refers to a certain unique moment, and, and from a pop music media perspective, it is not the same when you transfer a vinyl record to a, to a digital file. Uh, one can even say that this is, for the pop music perspective, still the same, it's still the same thing. Uh, although this violates another rule that I just, just brought up. Um, because its reproducibility is probably even more important uh, than the fact that it is recorded. So you could still say you have Sgt. Pepper in your hands when you have the CD version or if you just have been downloading a file, it is still Sgt. Pepper, uh, although it's a different thing than the vinyl object. And so the, the reproducibility uh, and uh, which leads to a strange ontology uh, of, the, of the pop object is more important than the fact that it is necessarily something recorded as opposed to, to music music which is not necessarily recorded and which even is not reproducible by uh, playing the recording again but if you are reproducing uh, classical music score you have to play it again and then it's again a singular moment. And this is like basically the, the, the even in the, it's in the well-known essay by Adorno from the 20s called Needle Curves, he's talking about the fact that uh, when you're listening to recorded music, you're not listening to music at all. Because listening to music, in the way he understands music, means to listen to someone playing, interpreting a score. But if you're listening to a recorded, recorded instance of music, you're listening to to, for the second time to someone interpreting it. So obviously you're not listening to the interpretation, you're listening to your own listening of the first time. And so his words for that, for, for what you do when you're listening to recorded music, recording of classical music is you are looking to your own uh, photo souvenir album. You're looking to your, to your, you, you're looking sentimentally into the, into the recording of your memories and not, you're not looking to the thing itself, you're not listening to the music itself. So, and that of course, this, this moment of memory from your own listening for the first time, this sentimental moment uh, is, the, is of course a key experience in the, in the pop music experience. So, uh, these were the, these were like six out of several uh, possible distinctions. Um, but you could always say uh, there are so many cases uh, in which it's not, not so clear to distinguish uh, and where it's not possible or not even, not even wanted by the situation or by a research interest to distinguish so definitely between uh, these two poles. So um, I would concede that uh, um, all these distinctions are not absolute. They are just, they are just tendencies, um, especially, this has to be uh, said, uh, especially if you are um, thinking of the technological change uh, between uh, analog and, and digital recording and, and, uh, and the distribution of analog and digital material and reproduction of course too. But what you can say is that uh, 
more about you can, you can make a, a perspective or a relational argument out of that. You can say whatever it's about, whatever the attraction is based in a given moment, uh, is what what leads to the distinction. Uh, so if it's about um, an immaterial singular uh, situation, then it's not about pop music. But if it's about the designing of something that is reproducible, material and recording based and linked to other media, linked to images, uh, linked to other types of signs, then it is about then it is pop music. And then uh, um, this is not the same thing. Can be both. It depends on research interest. It, depend, it depends on on uh, what the audience, uh, what is done with the audience, what the audience is doing with it. Uh, it depends on situational parameters. But uh, but those can, in most cases, be uh, decided. Those about those you can make a distinct, a definite decision. You say this is what it's about in that moment. This is what it's about in that situation. This is either a pop music moment or it's a music music moment. Um, and this leads to a kind of characteristics of um, an aesthetic situation. What, what if, if you are now, now we are stepping over only to the pop music side and we, uh, we're asking ourselves what uh, what do we need to think about, or what, do, what, are we what are we thinking about when we make decisions about producing, listening, dealing with uh, pop music objects, uh, situations? And the first thing is that since, since it is, uh, especially in the, in the early historic moments, um, and like most people, I I would uh, set the early historic moments for reasons of, for, for several reasons, but also for reasons of um, um, uh, yeah, be because it's because it is there is already a general agreement about it uh, in the in like in the mid 50s. In those moments, uh, for many th that that a recorded voice or recorded music reached. Um, a large audience was historically new. Um, recorded music uh, was so far only available in relation to um, uh, to, to radio broadcast, and uh, and the, although there was already a boom of um, of vinyl, not of vinyl, of, of uh, uh, shellac and and uh, and a gramophone recording in the in the 20s, uh, it has been replaced by by radio. So uh, the the popular music of the 30s and and 40s was mainly distributed by radio. And um, that the fact that you were on that that you made a decision of when to listen to something based on an on an object of a recording was a development of the 50s. But the most important thing is that you were listening to something where there was a singular uh, human being, obviously in a studio, uh, singing, and and you 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 had a recording of it. So there was an indexical relation to this voice. Uh, the 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 and this voice was obviously belonging to a body. So you had a you had an experience of uh, this um, uh, unique and indexical. Uh, uh, recording situation, but it, but this was now no longer in a world in which uh, the 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 senses were strictly separated by the general media architecture, but where there were all kinds of images around of the person of uh, whose whose um, uh, whose voice you were listening to. So there was a there were these two. Um, um, Media channels were used, but they were not used um, f in, in from one source. The the images of Elvis were not at the same space, at the same spot where you were listening to the voice. Uh, it was it was it was two different 
forms of information, two different media channels and two different types of science, of course. Um, so, um, and at the same time, uh, the, the frequency uh, of the presence of uh, those very specific voices uh, was uh, raising, rising. Uh, they, they, you had, you had, they were present in more and more spaces at, uh, uh, than, than, than ever before. And the aesthetic, the aesthetic um, difference to previous recorded voices was that uh, the, the singers from the 50s onwards uh, were not so much singers with a good voice, with a potent voice, with a strong voice, although some of them were, uh, but with a unique voice. Uh, it was more about uh, individual characteristics than it was about uh, musical or vocal uh, um, strengths in a, in a conventional sense. I mean, uh, the, the, the idea of strengths that existed in those years of early rock and roll and, and R&B uh, came from so-called shouters, now from, the, from the rhythm and blues shouters. Uh, and a shouter, of course, is not a, is not a strong singer. Uh, he's a shouter. And uh, he forces a voice upon someone. And, and this, this force is, of course, a, uh, an important uh, uh, impression for the listener. But it's not, it's not, a, uh, it's not a virtuosity but it's physical strength or, or even, uh, even some kind of uh, erotic uh, power, but it's not, uh, it's not the mastering of a voice. So uh, a mastered voice is basically working with a certain uh, conventional or uh, standardized ideal of what the aim of mastering is, of what good is, whereas these voices were supposed to be, uh, to be distinguished by their uniqueness. And so it was, it was much more from those years on, it was much more about recognizing some individuality in what was recorded than it was about recognizing a song or uh, understanding the lyrics or identifying with uh, the fact that this is about unhappy love or something like that. Uh, so the, the lyrics were uh, subordinated to the, the act of recognizing a voice. And the recognition was also connected no longer with only uh, having heard this voice before, but having seen a face of that singer. And not only having seen a face of that singer um, in one iconic image once, but having seen different versions of that face, of that, uh, having, having seen that face from different perspectives, in different light, in black and white and color, uh, on magazines, posters and TV. So it was uh, plenty of informations to put together, but they were not um, distributed by one single channel. So for all these informations, and all these um, attractions, there was, no, there was no centrality. And this corresponded a lot with the fact that different from previous ideas of how, to, how in cultural, industrial uh, or earlier artistic productions, uh, that there is a hierarchy of uh, actors, that there is a composer, and the composer writes something, some score, and then there is a conductor interpreting the composer and forcing his interpretation on an orchestra in which there are, again, other people interpreting the score and the gestures of the hierarchically superior conductor. And so this, this is just one, of, but it's a clearly a top-down architecture uh, of production with several instances of centrality. The conductor is central for the orchestra. Uh, there are other, other loc locuses of centrality in the orchestra. There's the first violinist and there are uh, uh, inferior violinists. There is a, sometimes there is a soloist and there are other musicians and so on. So there are all these, there are all these, these, these locuses of centrality. And, um, and of course, 
on the top of the pyramid is a composer. Uh, and you have similar ideas in, in, in other, in other uh, uh, productions and of course there are also always, there's always a struggle uh, how, how, to, how to interpret it and wh while we while we have the, while we experience the, the beginning of what I call pop music here, of course it was the same period that, that there was a, the uh, debate in the, in the magazine Cahiers du Cinema about who is the author of a film, uh, uh, who, what is the central instance of a film. And it was possible in film to just shift. No? I mean it was the, the standard idea is that the producer is the author, uh, before that it was the scriptwriter, then it became the producer and at the end of the 50s it was the director. But there was always still like, it was always only about replacing one hierarchical uh, actor through another. Uh, this is different I think in, in, in pop music it is very difficult and could never have been solved. Not only the authorship question because that is not the only way to construct a centrality. Uh, but to construct the centrality at all had become difficult and, and had never really worked. Um, um, yeah, so, um, but I'm going to offer an idea of what, <laughs> about the centrality in, in, uh, in pop music soon. Um, but what is also maybe interesting to say is that um, you have uh, in this decentralized reception of pop music where you are uh, listening to a record, uh, watching a magazine or going to a movie where you have the singer uh, or all these kind of uh, mixes, you have also, you are confronted with, with different uh, with these three different sign types that that Peirce speaks about, the index, the icon, and the and the symbol, because there's always there's there's, there's always the shift of um, like the the physicality that is that is indexically uh, um, uh, broadcasted or or transmitted, um, the um, uh, the iconicity of all those of the star photography, which has been taken over from from old Hollywood uh, from old Hollywood standards of, of how to photograph a star, but then uh, contrasted with uh, not so um, glamorous but also realistic images. It was always since rock and roll always this kind of competition between the, the glamorous and the realistic images, the, the the natural images, the sweating images, and the and the and the made up images uh, that were all kind of. Uh, uh, through icons, and then finally you had the uh, it, there were there were lyrics and there were texts and there were there was graphic design and there was there was like the, the word of, of of symbols and and, and writing uh, involved. So uh, that is something that, for example, in cinema uh, had been seen as a problem uh, when when people were still had had to had to to watch a movie and switch between the the emotional affective. Um, uh, visuality of, of, of moving images, it was seen as a, as a problem that then they had to read a title. Uh, so they needed, they needed to, to in, in increase the emotionality of the affectivity by, by adding a, a, a soundtrack. When, uh, and so the, the entire development of, uh, of cinema, although cinema is as much as, as pop music, a, a combined um, cultural industrial format uh, where you have different um, uh, different arts coming together the the tendency in the development of cinema was one towards centrality whereas uh, in pop music it's uh, towards decentrality and uh, but then of course uh, if it would be so as decentral as I'm as I've been arguing we we wouldn't be able we wouldn't be able to to talk about it as an object. So we would have to uh, we would have to think what how can how why what, how come I'm still talking about one object one subject matter if if there are all these decentral productions and in in different channels like magazines and uh, and. Uh, theatre, uh, concerts, uh, recordings, uh, um, and so on. And uh, the reason is, of course, uh, that it's, the, the central unit is, is the recipient. 
um, the the recipients have always been, I mean, one, one can always, this is always easy in any aesthetic debate to, to say, uh, 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 let's shift the perspective, let's, let's, let's look at it from the recipient's side. Um, but I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about just the aesthetics of reception of pop music, which you can, of course, always. I'm, I, would, I would like to talk about the recipient as, as an important component of the mediatic construction of it, uh, especially for, the, for one of the most important distinctions that, is, at least in the classical period of pop music, uh, constitute uh, its uh, construction as, a, as between two antagonists, and that is the distinction between life and studio. Um, so the, uh, the distinction between life and studio, studio is producing the transportable object. Life is producing one moment, uh, just as in traditional music music. Uh, but it is um, the ability or the, the experience of having witnessed both, walking back and forth between the two, which is, which is constituting the, uh, the pop music reception experience. Uh, and that is, that is paralleled by several, um, by several social Antagonisms. So basically, uh, in the mid 50s, you had um, you had uh, something like the, the conquest of bedrooms and children's rooms by uh, entertainment technology. You had for the first time uh, that that children. I mean, in the U.S., no, of course not, of course not everywhere, but but it started there. You had children that had uh, that had uh, little record players in their bedroom, uh, and you had. Uh, and you had people listening to uh, voices recorded somewhere in intimate situations, especially young and otherwise uh, new people um, were in moments of disorientation, uh, confusion, uh, lack of identity, were kind of listening to voices that were recorded somewhere. And when I'm saying voices, actually, I don't mean only voices here. I'm also mean, I also talk about the uh, strange noises and sounds coming from strange instruments and strange technology that you can also hear on pop music recordings. But they were hearing these voices in intimate situations, so they developed a relation of, of privacy and intimacy with this kind of, with this, this indexically uh, transmitted voices and uh, they belonged to them individually, they belonged to them and they were, they were defining their most intimate and specific private feelings. But the deal was to go out uh, and not necessarily to a concert but to a place, the alternative would be a place where the same recording would be played publicly and now you would have you would have this, this same very specific sound, this recorded sound, this one recording that you already know, but now it was in a situation where like plenty of other people were there. People who constituted a public. And, and of course at that age or, or at that state of confusion, you are not, what, what defines your confusion is that you're not apt to deal with the social situation, that you're not really really fully integrated into a social situation. And here you are, and there is, a, there is an integrated social, obviously seemingly integrated social public world, and you're not really part of it, but the only thing that you have in common is that you have a very specific relation to all those sounds and noises that come from the recording that everyone else is listening to there, in that bar or in that, in that whatever it is. I ice cream parlor, what you, what you want. And, uh, and this is uh, what now uh, constitutes uh, a pop music object inside of your, uh, when, when you are um, working through your experience that you have there. Uh, when, you, when you are a kind of uh, um, uh, trying to understand what's going on with you, is that you the mediate, the, 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 the tertium comparationis, the, the, uh, the, the medium between 
this not fully understood public life in which you are not fully integrated and your uh, personal psychological precarious uh, feelings is this music. It is the one thing that obviously means something in both situations and that constructs this pop music object uh, by this one recipient. But of course uh, structurally uh, by all recipients. All recipients do something like that with it. The only difference is that uh, of course their, their, their subjectivity in which they, in which they experience these, these two situations is experienced subjectively different but structurally uh, they all do that. They combine highly private and, and newly public moments and, and, uh, and define them via certain sounds. Um, and sometimes, I mean, if you're reading uh, reports and memories by pop music related authors in literature as well as in, as in documentary or autobiographical work, uh, people sometimes are able to extremely specific uh, to define when they experience such moments and what kind of things, what kind of acoustic objects those were related to. If you have, for example, in, there's, a, there's, an, there's an essay by Klaus Tevelight in which it's kind of a, kind of a, a thriller, thriller, thriller trial uh, on the piano by Jerry Lee Lewis, which is somehow encoding a very specific moment in. Uh, in, in, in Greer Marcos it was a feedback uh, sound at the end of a Sex Pistols song in The Winterland in San Francisco in 1977. So it's, it's very, uh, very specific moments that in which there's the, the, the two possibilities to experience that, highly private and in relation to some public situation, uh, are thought of coming together. And what you can say about these things is not aha, when you produce that kind of feedback you obviously uh, uh, <laughs> reach certain such reactions in the audience. You cannot say that. Just, there's no way to, to, to plan that. But you can say that, that um, recipients always uh, find as ideal um, uh, uh, code elements something that is not central to the to the piece from the from the artistic aspect, from the aspect of the intentions of, of, of composers, songwriters, producers, etc. Uh, they did not and they did not intend to make this feedback at the end very important. It's just that the general form of production made it possible that this could be uh, that this was um, that these kind of noises were were possible. So uh, I'm actually arguing that uh, that uh, in the in the uh, the, the, the centrality is only the centrality only exists on the level of of reception, and it is the uh, the shifting uh, recipient's subject. You cannot you cannot fix it. You cannot you cannot pin it down. But you can you can say how it structurally functions. And but there is no centrality on the other side. On the other side, uh, on the side of on the side of production, um, this leads to all kinds of. Um, uh, debates about uh, uh, especially the, the, the artistic and aesthetic nature uh, of pop music. It, it has always, people have always tried to define pop music as some form of literature and they try to argue that Bob Dylan should receive the Nobel Prize for literature uh, or they are trying to, uh, uh, to uh, define it as music music and they, they, they tell you how or whatever uh, whoever Keith Emerson or FX Twin or whoever is uh, virtuoso who's the next Bach or uh, whatever. Uh, and they, they use all these kind of traditional definitions for, for genius or um, but uh, of course it, this doesn't work. And the proposal that I do in the book, that's something I actually did not plan to talk about, but, uh, but the proposal of what is really the, um, kind of the from the perspective of production, uh, the most important unit uh, in, in pop music productions is the pose. Uh, and the pose would be, I would define the pose not as pretending to be something, but as exactly the middle between, uh, between talking about myself and playing a role. Uh, 
and in, in such a way that if you are posing, you are opening yourself up to a description or a definition, either something that happens to you, something that comes along, or something that is projected upon you. And both are uh, something that you cannot force upon you. You have to be, to a certain degree, passive. So that's, so, that's why music is so, is so helpful. Because you're playing here this music, then you are, you, you are absorbed by something, you're doing something. Uh, and it seems as if you're really doing this. But of course you are waiting for someone to project something upon you, or you're waiting for an interesting situation. You are performing that you are alive in a world of opportunities, in a world of adventure, that something could happen to you. You make yourself available for the audience. Uh, and you cannot, and it's, it's of course embarrassing and pretentious to make yourself available by just making yourself available. You have to be absorbed by something. And so that's why, why music is, is the, produ the production of music, the, the, the performance of music is helpful for the creation of the pose. But the pose itself uh, I think is based on the idea that um, um, as opposed to um, cinema, uh, fictional cinema or, or theater, um, there is no, there are no scripted parts in pop music. You are not Hamlet or you are not, uh, um, you are not um, <laughs> Macbeth. <laughs> to give well known examples. You are, uh, and on the, on the other hand, you are just, of course, if you are playing every night, this is not your intimate self. You're not really talking about yourself when you're saying, uh, I'm a rolling stone or whatever. You are, of course, you are playing a role. But you're not. You're not playing a scripted role, which is already just defined. You are, um, you are playing a role which is, um, in between um, the scripted role that, that pre-exists and, and the confessional mode of uh, some performance art, uh, which at least on paper is about confession or about really being yourself or about, about really bleeding or about these things that we all know from Marina Abramovic. Uh, so you are neither. No? You are neither Marina Abramovic nor are you Hamlet. And, uh, and this is, I think, uh, this is why the, this is what I call the pose. The pose is, is this in between, uh, and um, I actually, I'm actually owe this idea to Craig Owens, uh, who who talked about the the pose in photography in relation to uh, to, to ancient Greek uh, ancient Greek grammar, where you know in, in ancient Greek you don't have just the active voice and the passive voice. You have three voices. You have active, passive, and a third one which is called medium. So uh, not to be confused with the medium but uh, it's called medium and that would be kind of the, the voice of, of the pose. But okay that's just just a side. Um, so I place this... Am I talking too long? No. Uh, I, I place this entire... Uh, um, this, the, the, the way, the way I have constructed pop music, I place this in a historical um, model. Uh, and and this, this historical model uh, is referring to the fact that uh, for the theories of speculation by Guy de Boer or the cultural industry of Adorno Horkheimer, pop music is part of that. No? It's, it's, a, it's an industrial product, it's a cultural industrial product, it's based on division of labor and I said it's even the division of labor is even so dominant that you that you have no longer uh, the centrality of an author the centrality of an artist it's even it goes even beyond uh, cinema where at least there is still a struggle about who is who is the author um, and uh, but against those theories or against those interpretations uh, I argue that there were several cultural industries and of course that the that the major fault of the of those original theories of cultural industries that they are only based on a critique of ideology and not and, and do not uh, uh, include uh, uh, the, the, the history of 
uh, of media technology. So they, they are just talking about uh, the production side in terms of division of labor and, in the, and on the other hand on the, about the production of ideology and how that is necessary as part of, of, uh, of, of capitalism and, uh, and, 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 and commodity production. But what is, what is missing there is how this is organized in relation to, to media technology and in relation to types of commodities that are connected to media technology. So I propose that we have that there are three uh, stages of culture industry and pop music belongs to the second. The first would be the classical culture industry uh, which is based on the opposition or the antagonism of two uh, mediatic situation. One is cinema and the other is radio. And that is the two uh, that Adorno Horkheimer referred to. Uh, for them it's uh, all their examples come from cinema and radio. And later Adorno uh, uh, says, well I think television is the integration of the two. And, uh, and so to a degree he's right, but, but, uh, but he, doesn't, he doesn't take this as a, he doesn't, doesn't say, uh, uh, okay, if they're both integrated, that, that should be a different thing. We should describe that differently, but to them it's just one tendency. So that cinema and radio are, um, are there and, and they just want to come together and then they have a child and it's television and, and it's, it's so called, it's just a succession of it. But I would say that it's important that the relation between cinema and radio is one of different public spheres. So radio means you are at home and somebody gives you orders. Uh, somebody at home, the place where normally you are uh, safe from uh, the police and the state and, <laughs> and uh, and the fascists out there, you are, you are, you're turning off the radio. People tell you it's seven o'clock, uh, uh, and this and this has gone on in the world, and uh, so and this happens at the center of the of your bourgeois privacy, and uh, so this is radio, and uh, all of a sudden the public life, the policeman who tells you not to cross the street at the red light or something like that, is at your home, and. And then there is cinema, and you go, that means you go outside, you go into public life, and in public life there is a place where you start dreaming, uh, where, you start, where, you, where you all of a sudden leave the world. But you are, you're not dreaming in your bed, you're not dreaming in, 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 the, in the space of your privacy, you're dreaming in public, and you're getting orders at home. So a little bit in a kind of, uh, uh, in a way this is a reversal of a traditional, um, traditional distinction between, between private and public. Uh, and, um, so, yeah, th and this, this an analysis of the classical culture industry are, are based upon this and, uh, and also the way they talk about the fabrication of ideology have these two ideas of ideology. Uh, an ideology that either gives you orders, makes you, turns you into a conformist, or an ideology that, uh, that um, takes over by, by conquering your dreams, you know, as, as Hollywood does. So these are the two ways in which that happens. And, uh, but then there's, I would argue, there's a second um, uh, step. Uh, in, in a second cultural industry in which, um, which is based on pop music and TV. Uh, and here you have again two antagonistic worlds. Uh, TV is, 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 is acting conformist, TV is, uh, is made for all, it's, uh, at least in the beginning, now of course it's different. Uh, it's, it's, for, it's, for the, it's for the broad public, it's for everyone. It, it shows a lot of images of uh, of a new conformity of the 50s um, in, in the beginning and, and pop music is about distinction, difference, uh, um, uh, individuality uh, and, but also both integrate uh, more integrate more strongly than the other one did. Uh, television is both. It is dreaming and orders. Receiving orders and dreaming, both at home. And, uh, and pop music is also integrating two spheres, as I've said earlier, uh, in, uh, in public life. And it is also very much about that the persons, that the, that the recipients who integrate all these 
pop music related informations, they're not only doing that for themselves, but they're doing that in the public. They can be seen with their long hair. They are visible as uh, the medium that integrates these different informations. So that would be a second stage. Uh, and in that stage, um, something happens that would be another, could, could also be described in, in a theory of, it was a theory of, of distinctions, that, the, uh, that in the late 50s, um, the, the distinction between popular and non-popular or high and low uh, is kind of applied again upon the fields that have been created by the distinction in the first place. So the distinction of between a popular culture and a bourgeois culture or a high and low have produced these fields. But in the 50s, the uh, um, pop music uh, applies this distinction again on the field of the popular, creating now a kind of different popular, which is this in more intense, uh, more, more individualist, more specific, more uh, energetic, um, sexualized, etc., uh, and authentic more authentic field of pop music and the rest of the former popular culture. And at the same time you have something like that happening uh, in the realm of the so-called high bourgeois arts where you also have a, a now a distinction, uh, there's the same distinction applied on them, but those who apply the distinction, beatniks, pop art and so on, the independent group, they uh, they create this distinction anew, but now they place themselves on the lower side of the high. So do you, you have two, two territories, one, one in the lower side and on the upper side of the lower side, and one on the lower side of the upper side, and they are, of course have a bordering territory. And that is something that happens um, simultaneously as this, what I call the second cultural industry, has been um, yeah, uh, uh, developed. Of course, we're living now in the third cultural industry, and uh, I do not want to go too far into uh, into what that is. I mean, uh, the, uh, I would say that the, the locuses of integration of of everything uh, have uh, multiplied uh, in, the, in in digital internet culture, and uh, uh, the the the, the uh, quantity of information that is integrated there has multiplied, uh, but, uh, um, but that is, uh, it's, that's so to speak after, after the heroic years of pop music, although pop music is still there and still plays an important role uh, in that. Um, um, And what something that that in all three stages of of, uh, of the of the cultural industry, which is uh, which is a common trait of it, is a, a one constant is that the the which is maybe a banality now, but uh, but I think it's important uh, or it becomes important if you look at it historically is the shift from uh, the notion of the, of, the, of the artwork as, an, as a material object uh, to at the, at that, the, at the, the core of the artwork as a material object that has been done in such and such a way to and, and encodes spirit, encodes geist, mind uh, to um, the person itself, uh, the, the person that used to be encoded in that. Uh, that I think is the, is, is the uh, is the um, is the long tendency, a long-term tendency, uh, which had for several times been um, um, presenting itself as liberation, as as reconquering, reconquest of some kind of uh, authenticity of artistic production, uh, but has been uh, uh, and 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 even in a plausible way under under like. Uh, um, short-term developments, if you look at short-term developments, but in the long run has been kind of the, the dominant uh, tendency from like the earliest cultural industry uh, until today. Maybe I should come to a conclusion because I have too much here, but we're already over an hour, but uh, maybe one last thing 
about this um, uh, hypothesis of the three cultural industries would be um, that I conceive the cultural industries, plural, uh, neither as dominating uh, structures, um, but more like uh, similar to, to uh, uh, Althusser's idea of ideology as the sites of struggle. Um, I think that the cultural industry itself are sites of struggle. They are, they are in the end cultural industries, just as the ideologies are ideologies. Uh, but inside of them, struggle takes place. And the difference to, to Althusser is that uh, they are not, uh, the, these, these, um, the material of the struggle, the, the, the building blocks uh, of it are not uh, institutional material and state-related institutional material, but uh, commodity-related material. Uh, not state-related, but, uh, but um, uh, commercialism and capitalism related. So uh, one could say uh, they are uh, the, <laughs> the uh, yeah, they're not they're not they're not state apparatuses. They are uh, commodity apparatuses. But they are as much sites of struggle as as the state apparatuses are the uh, uh, the ideological state apparatuses. Uh, and um, and there's also basically no way to struggle outside of them. Um, and what has been important for the development of pop music was that um, um, the first cultural industry produced these uh, it produced these sites of dreaming and the sites of uh, command and. Uh, and those were kind of were produced uh, abysses between the recipients and the and the, the productions, the cultural productions, and and uh, and this has been criticized by by all those critics of cultural industry, also the not so elaborate elaborate ones, uh, as passivization. The cultural industrial products make you passive because they command you or they they set you asleep, they turn you into dreamers and uh, so you're passive. And uh, this is uh, was, was the dominant uh, critique. And uh, so, so the critical position towards it would, would always be in, in so many aesthetics and so many art ideas you have to activate the audience. If you activate the audience instead of passivating them, that is that that is a way out of the dilemma, uh, and the same. But the same idea was um, uh, was put forward by the cultural industry themselves because they also realized that if you are, I'm saying, I'm saying, calling them they, although I'm not thinking of them as people, but uh, uh, but but that's this side also realized uh, the the connection that you produce between audiences and. And, and products is of course much stronger if the audience is activated, if the audience actively uh, engages with uh, uh, with this kind of with this kind of production for for the for the larger collective for the larger broad masses. So uh, it's basically a collaboration, the, a collaboration of the critics, the the, the enlightened or uh, pro enlightenment critical leftist intellectuals, uh, their criticism of the cultural industry and the internal uh, optimization of the integration into cultural industrial relations collaborated in producing something like pop music as, a, as the critical uh, or optimized version of, the, um, of what the first cultural industry produced, glamour and, and command. And maybe I should uh, Stop here, uh, and I'm definitely uh, open for for your questions. Thank you.